Okay, excellent. Uh, so my name is Robert. Uh, I work uh, in the Kubernetes team in the IT PWPI section. And I focus mainly on the storage integration of our various uh, storage systems that the CERN cloud provides, integrating them into our container uh, offerings. Uh, so this is the agenda for the webinar. Um, we have introduction, then a couple of CSI drivers. We all uh, quickly go over what a CSI is and uh, what is it uh, used for. Uh, we have CMFS, EOS XD, and then uh, also we'll mention NFS. So let's go for it. Uh, so this is a screenshot of our Grafana dashboard of the CERN cloud. It provides many different storage kinds that uh, users can interact with and use for their uh, work or testing environments. And usually they need a way to somehow use this storage from within their Kubernetes pods. And that's mainly the topic of this uh, webinar. How do we do that and what are the new uh, uh, topics in the area? Um, so, as I mentioned, a lot of CSI, what is it? Uh, to explain that, we'll go a bit back in time. So, first, when Kubernetes was starting out, uh, there was only a concept of a persistent volume without any uh, way to create or provision uh, some space for your applications. You would literally have to go to some storage administrator, ask them to create a volume for you, and then they, they would uh, give you some access details on how to mount that volume in your cluster and expose it to your pods. Uh, this clearly wouldn't scale, so uh, and in addition to that, uh, there was the issue of how do, you, so once you have the information on uh, how to access the storage, how do you actually do that from within containers? Uh, initially, the nodes uh, in your cluster would be expected to already contain all the tooling uh, to uh, interact with the storage and mount it. Also, this is a big issue in terms of maintenance and uh, how you actually uh, accomplish that. So uh, to aid this, uh, Kubernetes team would, uh, or upstream Kubernetes would come up with uh, something called Flex plugins, uh, which using an interface, uh, you would create a Flex plugin. Uh, that would be able to mount a volume. So Kubernetes would know that, uh, okay, this pod is requesting such and such PV, uh, and it is linked with uh, uh, some flex uh, plugin. It was uh, basically an executable, uh, which Kubernetes would then uh, uh, run with uh, with some arguments passed to it on how to mount the volume and that's it. Again, this is uh, not, um, this wasn't very easily scalable and maintainable, uh, but it was an important step towards uh, having something better. Uh, and I should also mention that still there wasn't any way to request for new volumes. This only came later in 2016, uh, where a concept of storage classes was introduced, uh, which then enabled the users and uh, cluster administrators to request for to, to create a PVC, which before didn't exist, there was only persistent volumes. They would create PVC 
PVC that would uh, uh, refer to a storage class on how to create the volume. And then you would have uh, something that would be able to talk to the storage system and make it so that by the end of the procedure of uh, handling the PVC, at the end you would be given essentially what here uh, as the first step, <clears throat> uh, the class, uh, the storage administrator would give you. <clears throat> here it would be optimized by uh, Kubernetes. The problem here was that uh, all of this uh, storage related code and uh, related to provisioning, this was <clears throat> all part of Kubernetes code base. Uh, you can imagine like, for example, with Linux kernel, when there are uh, drivers that are part of the code base and are in tree, uh, it's very difficult to, uh, for example, uh, fix a bug or release a new version. You always would have to wait until the parent project, in this case, Kubernetes would release a new version and you would have your changes ready by the time the release window was uh, still open. So this was another issue, how to have uh, an issue to solve. Uh, essentially having parallel uh, development uh, branches, uh, let's say. So we needed a way to separate the storage related code from Kubernetes code base. Uh, and this, uh, and all the previous issues that I mentioned, given birth to something called CSI. So container storage interface. Uh, so what is it? Uh, it's an industry standard for cluster-wide storage plugins. Uh, it was created in a collaboration of communities uh, like Kubernetes, Mesos, Docker, Cloud Foundry. And it essentially defines the protocol between the orchestrator, so Kubernetes in our case, and uh, a plugin that can then communicate with uh, the storage system and do all the operations that will then lead to, for example, provisioning a volume, provisioning a snapshot, or mounting a volume. What's important here is that CSI as a standard is uh, orchestrator agnostic. So it doesn't have any strong links to Kubernetes. There is still during the time where wasn't completely clear uh, which orchestrator uh, would be the most popular. So there was a need for certain standardization. Uh, nowadays, since uh, Kubernetes is, uh, let's say, most popular, this need is uh, less of an issue. In any case, uh, standards and keeping things, uh, uh, orchestrator specific things out of the uh, interfaces is uh, a plus in any case. So um, we have uh, this uh, standard interface. Um, in architecture, the <clears throat> so we have a CSI driver as, I, as we've seen here, so we have a driver for CMFS, CLS XD, and so on. Uh, it's split into two plugins, uh, controller and node plugin. The controller plugin handles all cluster-wide operations like provisioning, and the node plugin uh, does the node local operations like mounting a volume. Uh, at CERN, we have, as I mentioned, many different types of storage and many different services that manage it. Uh, we have Manila, Cinder, 
Ceph, EOS, CVMFS. And our goal is to have good integration with all of those and make them available to our users so they can use any of those seamlessly uh, without having to care too much about the details of any of the particular service they are using. They, the idea is to essentially just have a PVC and as long as they follow some guidelines like the fact that Manila uh, shares are a shared file systems that can be mounted by multiple nodes. Whereas Cinder isn't, it's a block, uh, it provides block devices which can be mounted to only to a one node at a time. Uh, so uh, as long as users follow these uh, guidelines, uh, they can use any PVCs they create and uh, it's transparent to them. We can have a look at uh, how such deployments actually look like in a cluster. It's 125, by the way. So, well, we can do uh, get CSI drivers. And we, we can see like we have one for CFS, one for manual CFS, EOS, XD. Uh, which driver is being deployed can be configured with a label when you run uh, OpenStack COE cluster create. Uh, this cluster just happens to be containing uh, these CSI drivers that you see here. Um, in terms of workload, what they actually run, I have a look here. So, as I mentioned, so we have CVMFS, one for Ceph, uh, one for Manila, one for uh, EOS XD, and you can see that there is a controller plugin with, where there is only one of those usually. And then on each node, We then have uh, a node node plugin, right? So we have two nodes in the yeah, two worker nodes in the cluster, and uh, it's deployed as a the, the node plugins are deployed as a daemon set. So if a node is expected to mount a certain kind of uh, PVC, it must be running this node plugin of uh, that that is responsible for that storage. Uh, kind. We have seen a couple of times uh, users complaining that they cannot mount their CFS shares. Uh, most of the time this was due to the fact that um, they would have a taint on the node which would prevent the, the node plugin to be deployed there. Uh, the fix for that would be then to add a toleration uh, in the demand set, which we do now by default. So uh, those sort of issues should be now uh, not happening. But if they are, it usually um, if if uh, the error says we, I think we have this one in. Uh, Okay, never mind. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, there would be an error on the pod saying that uh, such and such CSI plugin is uh, not found. And that's because the pod responsible for mounting the volume is not, does not exist on the node.
we essentially see how the the cluster going back um, so we have CVMFS. This is one of the areas where we've made quite a big progress since um, the early versions of the driver. Uh, what we had before, there was uh, before 2018, but this is no longer relevant. Uh, we had the, it started as a just a Docker plugin for volumes uh, that would run the CVMFS client and this would be deployed as a demand set so that uh, and uh, the CVMFS root would be exposed as a host pod on the node and then the user pods would mount this host pod and would be able to uh, access the CVMFS repositories. Uh, then it would rely on uh, next iteration of, of this Docker volume CVMFS would rely on flex volume uh, arch architecture that I mentioned earlier. Um, all of this was then superseded by a CSI version of, uh, of uh, this comment. Uh, starting in 20, uh, 2018. Uh, at first, it was basically a copy paste of the old code base. Just with the overall uh, Kubernetes. Uh, the big changes then came in version two and on. Uh, the whole pa uh, home page for the project is here. Um, <clears throat> a couple of the improvements that we made uh, are auto mounts, uh, dynamic config loading, uh, per volume conf con configuration, uh, and so on. So uh, we can have a look on what does does this mean? <clears throat> uh, first of all, auto mounts. Um, before, uh, in uh, in the Docker volume, as well as the first <clears throat> version of the CSI driver, uh, the only way to expose a CVMFS repository was through something <clears throat> called a private mount which would mean that in all your user uh, pods, you would have to know in advance which CVMFS repositories you will need. Uh, this then caused many issues for our users who uh, don't have this information beforehand. They simply want their all their the repositories that they have the client configured for available, but they don't want to mount them all at a single time. They just want to have them on demand. Uh, a way to solve this, and CVMFS itself already has uh, support for that, is auto mounts. Uh, what we then had to do is uh, to implement the auto mount uh, support also in the CS on the CSI side. <clears throat> so now, uh, what we can do for the CVM in example uh, directory. By the way, all of these examples that I will be showing are available in the respective. Uh, project repositories. So they're all publicly available. You can try them yourself after deploying the component. Uh, <clears throat> so let's try the, uh, the auto mount example. What we need first is 
to have a PV or P, uh, PV PVC pair uh, that we will be mounting in a pot. Um, I believe I already have done that. Yes, um, but we can do it again uh, for the sake of a demo. Okay, so <clears throat> we'll create this. Uh, so here we have a storage class and a persistent volume claim that creates from the storage class. Uh, so once we do that, should have PVC ready. Uh, what we could have also done just for uh, due to the fact how the CSI driver is implemented is to create a persistent volume object um, uh, by hand and then persistent volume claim that links back to the PV. The reason why we used a storage class is just simply it's less work, you don't have to write all of this by hand, but uh, what I should also note is that the provisioning itself does nothing, it, it simply tells Kubernetes to create this persistent volume object and that is linked to a PVC. Uh, it doesn't really touch the CVMFS stores in any way, so the provisioning part for uh, in this case, is, so just Kubernetes knows about um, the the volumes and um, we have a re reference which we can then use in our pods. So we have the PVC, we can create a pod uh, which looks like this. Uh, so it's running a busy box with a sleep and it's mounting the PVC that we have just uh, created. This one. What is also important here to note is the volume mounts need to have mount propagation set to host to container. Uh, this is necessary for the auto mounts to then uh, be propagated across uh, containers. Without this, uh, you would see an error, which I think we have either here or. Uh, be here in the documentation. Yeah, so we have a um, section called troubleshooting and here are the most frequent errors that we have gathered from our users. Um, so you would see too many levels of symbolic link when trying to, I can actually show these two first. So if we omit this mount propagation, uh, thanks to <clears throat> access any, this is uh, from previous test logis. This uh, should not have worked. We should see these too many levels of symbolic links uh, here. Yep, this 
So this is the one. So to fix that, uh, only to create the pod with this mount propagation correctly defined. Now it works correctly. So before we had alice.srun.ch, too many levels of symbolic links. Now it works as it should. So this is really important when uh, creating your pods. You can clean it up. So we keep the slate green for the next examples. So. Uh, this is the uh, auto mount feature. You can uh, essentially mount any repositories that you have uh, configured. Another cool thing that we have added since uh, that wasn't available in uh, previous versions uh, is dynamic config uh, client configuration loading. So Going back again to this pod. Um, let's say we want to access uh, this ILC DESI repository. which if I don't, okay. Uh, it will fail because we simply don't, the CVMFS client doesn't know how to get to this repository. What we can do though is, uh, so the, the client config, uh, configs are exposed through a config map um, and as a, Cluster administrator, you can edit the config map. Uh, this one, CMFS uh, CSI config D. And we add whatever the, the repository says is their configuration. Uh, in this case, if this, we define the server URLs and public key. And now, as soon as the, the config map uh, contents are uh, propagated to the node, we'll be able to mount the repository. Let's see if that has worked. There is some uh, update interval at which Kubelet pulls the config map content. So it might take some time. What we can do instead is uh, is to If we uh, update the annotation on the node, this should uh, trigger also pulling uh, the config map contents. 
Uh, okay, we can, uh, I guess, get back to this uh, moment. Okay, so now it works. So uh, we see by uh, just adding the line configurations in the config map, we have been able to, uh, without any downtime, uh, add information for new repositories that we can now uh, access from our pods. So that's that. Um, let's continue. Uh, what I would also like to mention uh, the upgrade from CMFS CSI V1 to V2. Uh, we had some users who had issues with this one. Uh, the procedure for doing this is a bit convoluted. Uh, and on global scale, the, there is no downtime, but there is downtime localized to a single node at a time. Uh, to upgrade from uh, first to the second version of the driver, uh, what uh, the cluster admin needs to update the update strategy to on delete. And why do we need this is because uh, CVMFS itself, the, the client is implemented as a fuse file system. So there is a user space process that uh, begs the mount point uh, that the applications then access and browse the, the repositories. And is, if this process uh, goes down for any reason, for example, the node plugin of CMFS CSI uh, is restarted as a result of the upgrade. Also, the mount point and the mount, po mount points of your um, application pods uh, will go down, uh, making the, uh, the volume essentially unavailable. This is the error, what you would see. So transport endpoint is not connected, meaning the fuse uh, process that was backing the, uh, the mount point uh, doesn't exist anymore. Uh, what, and we can actually even see this in action. So we have on this node, we have for CMFS this node plugin. And if we kill it, uh, Just to prove that uh, this is still working. So oh, it's working, but if I delete the node plugin, So either there is uh, an empty directory or uh, if you were reading a file at the exact moment the node plugin was being deleted, deleted uh, you would see this error. Uh, a way to solve this or fix this issue on the 
note is to unfortunately delete your delete the the pod that was using the volume if it was a deployment uh, the pod that was deleted would be replaced by the new replica and this new replica would regain access to uh, to the volume uh, there is a mount re uh, restoration procedure that is being done and uh, <clears throat> you essentially need to recreate the mounts to uh, have the volume available again and this is also what you need to do during the upgrade uh, so for uh, so we have set the update strategy to on delete now you would then do helm upgrade of the cmfs driver and then for every node one at a time to limit the outage to just that node or the avail uh, unavailability um, you would delete the old v1 node plugin wait until the v2 starts up uh, and keep in mind that the application pods that were using the volume will have uh, io failures like we saw uh, just a moment ago and uh, deleting those pods on on that node uh, will then uh, refresh the mounts and you can move on to the next node in your cluster uh, to finish the upgrade. Um, so that's it for the upgrading. Uh, maybe an interesting thing about the auto mounts. Uh, when we were researching how to do this uh, and discussing this with the upstream Kubernetes and CSI developers. Uh, there weren't any other storage systems that also make use of AutoFS. Uh, and here at CERN, we are actually using even two of them. So uh, people didn't really have a lot of uh, experience in how to set this up properly. Uh, so this was, let's say, uncharted territory for, uh, for us. So essentially what it boiled down to was uh, running the node plugin in PID, uh, in hosts PID namespace to make the outmount daemon responsible for, uh, well, handling and calling the mount uh, system calls uh, for this daemon to be visible on the on the node and then also the mount points of the cvmfs root that is now backed by autofs needed to be properly uh, let's say marked with uh, shared or slave uh, propagation uh, uh, tags and once this was uh, correctly done, as the diag diagram shows, so the AutoFS root needed to be shared. Uh, then on the node, when this was bind mounted, uh, it needed to be done so recursively uh, as a slave uh, bind mount. It needed to be slave and not shared because when uh, so this is the application pod when this application pod goes down and kubelet starts unmounting uh, the volumes uh, the unmount call would then be propagated if this was shared back to the uh, the global mount of cmfs for the whole node affecting other pods there so that's uh, obviously not what we wanted so uh, it needed to be slave and 
then also in the application pod, it needed also needs to be slave to uh, receive the mount events. Uh, and this is what we saw in the host uh, in the mount propagation uh, directive in uh, the volume mount section. Um, so this is basically how it was implemented. And okay, so that's it for CMFS for EOS XD. Uh, so since we were on the subject of auto mount, I'll, I will just mention that. Uh, oops, I have forgotten to update the link here. Uh, the, the EOS XD CSI driver also supports auto mounts and is implemented the exactly same way. So, uh, before we, uh, yeah, in current versions of the of our Kubernetes offerings, we provide EOS XD daemon set, uh, which essentially runs a script that mounts EOS uh, volumes and exposes them on a host path slash var slash EOS. And then uh, user applications would also access this path and, uh, and access their EOS volumes. Uh, <clears throat> essentially the same way what CVMFS had before uh, here in this Docker volume CVMFS. Uh, replacing that with uh, a CSI version of the driver. So this one is available in here GitLab uh, Kubernetes storage uh, USXD. <clears throat> and it is essentially the same thing uh, as we currently provide, but it is converted into a CSI driver. But in addition to that, it uh, mounts the volumes uh, through AutoFS. So the default uh, resource consumption on the node is much lower than uh, before because um, you essentially need to mount only the, you do mount on demand. So only the volumes that you actually, only the EOS instances that you actually need will be mounted. And in addition to the, that, uh, the CSI version also supports OAuth based authentication. And also there is room for improvement. So for now we support only mounting. We could uh, eventually support provisioning like we do with CFS, uh, but uh, this is for further discussions with the respective teams. So we can have a demo of this uh, thing. And as I mentioned, all the examples that I'm showing here are uh, available in the uh, on the projects uh, repositories. So again, like in case of uh, uh, of CMFS, we need to create a PVC that we will mount in our pods. Let's do that again. So we have this, so recreate what we have just deleted. So we have a PVC available. It looks like this. So we say that the PV is man managed by the EOSXD driver. It's read write many. The capacity, we don't care because uh, it's not tracked. Uh, uh, we are not provisioning the volume, so 
uh, it is of arbitrary non-zero or larger than zero size. And uh, then we create a PVC that uh, refers back to the PV. And we can, uh, we can uh, get a pod and exactly the same situation as before. So the volume mount needs, because this is backed by AutoFS, it needs the mount propagation to be set as host to container. Uh, so we can, It took a bit to uh, download the image. So we could browse the EOS directory, but we are not uh, on authenticated. Normally, we would have to create a Kerberos ticket. So we would do k init and username and uh, login. Uh, this is, in many cases, uh, an obstacle. Uh, so the EOS client provides, in addition, to authenticating with Kerberos, also OAuth. Uh, which we will see just in a moment, a demo of that. So for the, uh, uh, well, one of the reasons why Kerberos tickets are an issue is the well, first of all, the image needs to contain the Kerberos tooling. Then you need to input your password there. And um, in many cases, this is uh, problematic or just not an ideal workflow to, to have. So what we worked on recently is uh, a component that would handle the OAuth tokens. And the use case for this initially was to, for it to be consumed with EOS client uh, to avoid having to do K in it. Unfortunately, there wasn't any component that would handle this for us. So we needed uh, refreshing of the access tokens, uh, injecting them into the pods that then access the volume. This was a big issue, even though it's practically very small. Uh, we'll see in a bit. Uh, this alone uh, needed a lot of uh, work to get done right, because uh, EOSXD has is particular about how it expects the OAuth token to, uh, to be, the format of the file, the permissions. So uh, it couldn't be done just through like, a secret that would something, something would be updating it and uh, just mounting the secret in the pod, uh, it needed uh, much more work. So this is a component that we have worked on for some time and it will be available in uh, the next uh, Kubernetes releases we will, we will be publishing. Um, and what it essentially does is you uh, create a secret containing the token. Uh, the 
controller uh, of this component will then uh, notice because uh, the, the secret would be marked by uh, would, would be annotated with a special annotation that the controller recognizes and it would queue it up for refreshing so before it uh, the token would expire it would uh, refresh it and on the other side of the the equa equation you would have a pod that needs to consume the the secret and here by annotating your pod uh, you would get the refreshed tokens in a format that uh, your application needs and refreshed uh, periodically so we can see the end well the, the main point of course is the, that it actually works with the OSX DCSI. Uh, so we can see this in action by the way we have also documentation for all of this also in our kubernetes docs run .ch. so it's in uh, security credentials and this part here <clears throat> so let's see this in action um, the secret itself that would contain the token uh, would look like this so uh, it contains the OAuth uh, field that has the access token as well as the <clears throat> refresh token and any other fields that are outputted <clears throat> from the uh, OIDC token endpoint. But essentially, the, the refresh controller doesn't care about any other field, just this access and uh, <clears throat> refresh tokens. And then you need to also supply client ID <clears throat> and client secret. Uh, so once you create this secret, um, I already did <clears throat> just not to show you my uh, you know, login credentials. I, I will not <clears throat> uh, output the contents, but <clears throat> uh, excuse me. <clears throat> but uh, it's this one. <clears throat> And uh, then a pod that would then be able to. So uh, we can also <clears throat> check the logs and see how this is in action. So the um, component responsible for refreshing the tokens is <clears throat> called. Uh, the refresher it's a deployment <clears throat> and it will uh, periodically uh, refresh the, the access and refresh tokens before the they expire obviously so uh, we have the secret and now we want to create a pod how to inject the uh, uh, thing. Uh, how to inject the tokens uh, in your pods is again by having an annotation uh, so you say to inject so what you actually want to inject it's a json uh, string essentially an array of two objects uh, containing the name of the secret where you have the tokens the container into which you want to then inject the token uh, the owner so uh, this is the GID as well as UID that will be set to the file 
and then a file path where you want this token to uh, exist in the container. It can be arbitrary location. Uh, the controller doesn't care if it's uh, like ephemeral storage of the container or if it's a PVC or whatever. It just needs uh, an absolute path within the container and it will store the file there. By default, if you don't specify the file path, it's slash TMP slash uh, this one. So out tk underscore, and this number then uh, refers to the uh, UID of the container yeah, that you specify in the security context. Um, there is this thing called uh, template config uh, map name. So the contents of the file that contains uh, the, the where you project the the OAuth token are by default just the access token. So there is nothing else in the file, just the access token. If you or your application then consumes the token, uh, if it needs something other than just the access token, you can specify the template of the file in a config map which looks like this. So there is a template field and something access token something, for example, in this case. And this uh, variable will be then uh, uh, replaced by, uh, by the actual access token. So to see this in action, we can go to ESXD and we have already uh, pod predefined for this. Uh, so EOS client expects the uh, the token file to be in this format, so it needs to start with OAuth two uh, and followed by access token, followed by user info. URL to the user info endpoint. Uh, so that's essentially what we do here. Uh, we then supply the, the, the config map name, uh, specify the secret name that where I'm storing my uh, user credentials, specify the container in the, this idle container. Named, named idle and the config map uh, template name, which refers to uh, to the one we see above. So if we create this, um, all right, uh, so the config map already exists, but in any case, have this pod running. And looking into the slash TMP, we can see that there is the OAuth token being injected uh, by the component. And Having the token here makes us able to then access the home, uh, access my home directory. So this is it. It's very uneventful and just works like that, but it should be, it's also very streamlined in the fact that all that you have to declare for uh, having uh, OAuth access tokens uh, usable and you making them used by the EOS client is just uh, stating that in the annotation of the pod, 
and without having to run any k in it and other things um, i can access my home folder so that's it for the for eos um last part which i will go now quickly over because i think we are running out of time uh is nfs so uh Kubernetes already has NFS integration in three, but this one is unmaintained. So uh, like most of the storage system specific code in Kubernetes, um, NFS is also one of uh, the, the instances where support remains within Kubernetes in three, uh, but is not maintained anymore it's just there for the sake of uh, backwards compatibility but uh, the goal there is to eventually transfer uh, to move into the C uh, csi direction and relying on a csi driver that cluster administrator would deploy in their cl cluster and so this one was developed by uh, the upstream community, but for us is it's important uh, use case mainly for ATS because uh, in TN and uh, the ATS clusters the uh, the storage isn't uh, safe uh, and similar that we normally rely on in uh, GPN, but in TN clusters uh, uh, the storage uh, chosen for for general use is nfs and uh, we'll be deploying this one in by default as of 126 uh, so that's good news basically that we uh, external storage will be available in those clusters also in a form of nfs shares and reaching Conclusion finally, so um, we have done over time improvements in many areas. Uh, we are slowly but surely uh, transferring all the storage bits that we relied on on unmaintained software essentially, or un uh, bits that should be. Um, moved to CSI part, their CSI counterparts. Uh, we are uh, almost done at this point, um, with the exception of uh, EOS that we are fixing actually just now. So we are having this uh, CSI driver that will replace the demand set that, uh, which we are currently relying on and uh, more to follow uh, and that's it for the presentation we can move on to questions if there are any Maybe I can start with one, Robert. Uh, I don't know yes. if you mentioned uh, the um, comparison between the EOS, the old demon set, and the uh, CSI uh, in terms of functionality. Mm -hmm. uh, I briefly went over this, but I can. Uh, I can go into more and detail. Also yeah, I guess it's also a question for others to see uh, how, how they would see the impact of these differences. Mm -hmm. uh, so the main change here is the auto mounts and um, 
the main change here was the auto mount. Uh, let me just quickly update the, the link for this. Okay, here we have the correct link. Uh, so the main difference is auto mounts, but also way we expose uh, the volume to the pot. Before uh, the volumes, uh, the whole EOS route was exposed on a host pad as a, well, at slash var slash EOS. And the application pods would then also mount this host, the same host pod, essentially being able to access the EOS instances that the client is configured for. Um, what this is not so obvious from, from this, but what it means, we'll go back to also this upgrade procedure. Uh, when I can uh, remind that if you delete a node plugin that runs a fuse process, uh, all the <clears throat> mounts that it was providing will be uh, defunct. So unavailable and you will have uh, IO failures. Uh, What EOS XD, the, the demand set, so let's say the, the current version of uh, exposing EOS uh, volumes, what it currently does is <clears throat> at startup, it, if it's ever killed or, or the, the client crashes, it will reload those mounts and mount them again in slash fire slash EOS. Since this is a simple bind mount from from the EOS XD demand set to the node and from the node then into your application pod. Uh, even if the demand set pod is killed, after it starts up, the mounts will uh, start working again. This is not the case with the CSI version and how it works. So <clears throat> uh, essentially a security feature and not, not exposing host paths to, uh, to user application then also causes uh, <clears throat> the inability to propagate mounts, propagate existing uh, mounts uh, to refresh them. So what would happen here if you killed a node uh, EOS XD CSI node plugin uh, is you would have to restart the, <clears throat> your application pod as opposed to EOS XD daemon set where you wouldn't, would not have to restart your, your application pods. They would continue working, assuming that, uh, you know, you. In both cases, you, you lost the mount and there could have been some uh, IO corruption. Just in the case of the uh, our <clears throat> current integration, uh, the mounts will come back up again uh, silently. Whereas in the CSI version, you would have to manually for the, for the moment manually intervene and restart your application pods. It, I think it's a really uh, like philosophical or depends on how you want to approach the problem. It's a question 
like this, I guess, because uh, if you lose your mounts uh, and you, you lose your volumes, uh, there could be cases that your data is corrupted and you need you would need to step in anyway to resolve the situation. Um, if you just open a file, write and close the file, and you have this in some sort of loop. So if there is a failure, try to open, write and close again. In this sort of situ situation, it would uh, work, uh, this demand set approach. But um, on the other hand, the question is if this is correct. The, the question for users, I guess, is uh, if they are relying on this behavior. I guess they wouldn't notice anyway, because if it re uh, reloads the mounts anyway, uh, they maybe don't know that this is happening, that sometimes the EOS client uh, crashes and it will automatically uh, reload the, the mount points. Uh, so if this is something users uh, rely on, uh, I guess uh, they can reach out and uh, can have further discussion. Uh, Ricardo, sorry, you, you wanted to? No, no, that was it. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. We have okay. many questions. Okay, um, well, I guess if that's it, uh, we can finish. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, attention for the questions and uh, see you soon. Bye.